Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Susan Stewart, and I'm the director of the Open University in Scotland. And we forgot to bring our banner. I forgot to bring the banner <laughs> down, so uh, I've got my Open University in Scotland face mask instead. So we can wave that about. Um, and I'm here with Denise Miner this morning, uh, one of Scotland's best loved novelists and writers. Um, you have uh, been writing, I think your first book, Garnet Hill Trilogy, was 89? Yep. Right? Yeah? <coughs> um, and many of you here, like me, will eagerly anticipate Denise's new books when they come out. She's one of very few authors that I buy the hardback uh, and don't <laughs> wait for the paperback. Um, so we've had the um, Garnet Hill Trilogy and uh, Paddy Meehan and Alec Morrow and a couple of years ago, I think it was your first venture into writing a fictionalised account of real-life events with the long drop, um, which I think won the Michael Vanney uh -huh. Yeah. Um, so this is your, your second attempt at fictionalising a historical event, this time the murder of Mary Queen of Scots, private secretary, Ritzio. Um, what, what led you to uh, write this book, please? Well, there's a, there's, a, there's a guy called Jamie Crawford. Really? I mean, obviously, the real story is this just came to me in a dream or something like that. But, <laughs> but, what, but pragmatically, what actually happened was um, there's a guy called Jamie Crawford, and he, he commissioned a, a series of short stories called Bloody Scotland. He was working for Historic Environment Scotland, yeah. and um, he commissioned this series of um, short stories. And I just... Very few people buy short stories, honestly. And uh, we love to write them, but not that many people buy them. And um, anyway, so I just thought, oh, yeah, all right then. And uh, we had to pick, because he had contacts in Historic Environment Scotland, mm -hmm. we had to pick a site. But as I was explaining to you earlier, I don't always read to the end of the email, and I failed to pick a site. And so all the good ones were gone. Right. And I got Edinburgh Castle, which feels very well known. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't feel like, so we were getting a private tour of these places. And uh, anyway, I went up with a friend and we got a private tour of Edinburgh Castle, which was amazing because, yeah. I don't know if you know this, but a lot of the bits of Edinburgh Castle are, are now shut to tourists because right. they're so unsafe. <laughs> <laughs> and, and all of it, like when China and Russia opened up, lots of people, lots of visitors came over who didn't speak English and all the tour guides spoke English. Yeah. So they couldn't say things, you know, if they were shouting, get away from there, they didn't know what they were saying to them. So um, I think there were like, you know, a, a number of near misses. So they shut Sounds down. Sounds like a fantastic environment for a crime writer. It's a fantastic environment. <laughs> it's amazing. And um, so they had to shut down lots of bits that yeah. you used to be able to get access to. So uh, one of the things was um, a dungeon that John McLean was held in. Oh, right. Um, yeah, and um, you know, and there's like these parapets, and there's like a hole, and it goes straight down the cliff face, and that was the toilet for the guard. Mm. I mean, there's lots of bits you're not allowed to go to. So we got this tour. And you got into all we them. got into all these bits. Right. So it was a really, really amazing tour. And um, uh, anyway, I wrote a story, and because it's such a sinister place, right. when you actually go, we actually got down into the bottom. We got it to go on this. Um, a spiral staircase in St, under St David's under David's Tower, is that right? Anyway, it was very, very right. unsafe. There were several things that we did that were clearly not. Fit you hadn't for been health and safety before. Yeah, hadn't been. And he was like, "How gung ho are you?" And we were like, "We are very gung ho." <laughs> he said, "So why don't you just climb up this very, very sugarly um, fifty-foot uh, spiral staircase?" So we did that, and uh, um, anyway. But it was such a sinister kind of, uh, you know, we saw the real kind of history of it, not the mm. disnified history of it. So I wrote a story that was very, very sinister. Yeah. And I thought they're going to clean that up, and they and he said no, it's fine. And we won lots of prizes together. Yeah. Uh, for that short story, and um, uh, it was about a family visit in Edinburgh Castle, and then they get into the actual spirit of Edinburgh Castle, and um, and it was called How many after them. three. In a short story. In a short story, it was a lot. <laughs> um, and uh, it was named after the motto over the gate, which is, um, oh, I was going to say res ipsa locator, but it's not that at all. I can't remember what it is, but it's a Latin phrase, and it means basically, woe betide anyone who crosses me, which, which is the, the motto above the gate right. to Edinburgh Castle. And it's, it's all over the place, actually. Um, so, uh, anyway, Jamie Crawford then asked me if I would write this history of Rizzio uh, and, and it was just because it was him and I said yeah all right then 
and uh, and then I started doing research into it. And I, I wanted to make it a really um, succinct time period because uh -huh. one of the things that I really, um, you know, when I'm reading true crime or I'm reading history, very often it's chronological and it covers a huge yep. time span, yep. which was what all the histories of this incident that I read um, were like. And actually, it, it's such an incendiary event and it's so telling. Um, but it gets lost in subsequent events and yeah. events before. So yeah. I thought it would be great just to focus on that weekend in Edinburgh. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's a very brutal weekend and I hadn't realised how many times Ritzeal was stabbed because they all stabbed him so that there was collective responsibility. I mean, I, you know, I mean, I don't know if they were influenced by Julius Caesar's assassination, but yeah. but um, Shakespeare wrote Julius Caesar like 20 years later, and I'm sure he was influenced by Rizzio. Aye. But the idea was that if the entire ruling class of Scotland stabbed this guy, then nobody could be done for the murder, yeah. Yeah. Um, or or the whole class would fall. Yeah. Um, and uh, so so basically, all the nobles of Scotland lined up. <laughs> and stab this guy, right. which if you even imagine the logistics of, you know, 50 people mm -hmm. queuing up to mm -hmm. stab somebody. Yeah. It's ex extraordinary. You know? How much how much did you know about Mary, Queen of Scots and Rizzio? Because, I mean, she's one of the most mythologised and perhaps romanticised characters in, in Scottish history. But, yeah, I just Did you have to do a lot of research? I had to do a lot of research yeah. to get past all the myth. Aye. Do you know what I mean? The weeping ginger tall girl. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. There's, there's so much. I'm not terribly interested in royals mm -hmm. and and I was I would never have thought I would write anything about a royal character yeah. and um, uh, you know she's so um, she, she stands behind palls of royal smoke so a mm -hmm. lot of the books that I read about her were how beautiful she was yeah. and how amazing she was. Quite unctuous yeah. kind of characterizations of royal people. Yeah. And I'm really interested in the person. I'm not really interested in... I'm, okay. I'm interested in empathising rather than eulogising. Yeah. So I thought, you know, she's 23, she's six months pregnant, she's in a foreign country, she's moved around a lot, she's been in fear of her life all her life. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, she's very pious. So mm -hmm. she was very Catholic. Yeah. And as a Catholic in Scotland, even now... I mean, as a Catholic who came back to Scotland, so, mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't grow up with... You know, I mean, I remember meeting a cousin and a cousin saying, you can, it, it, they lived in Shettleston, uh -huh. and, say, and we were living in Paris at the time, and saying, you can tell Protestants from Catholics by the colours they wear, and which is, was true in Shettleston in the 70s. Right. And I just thought, God, these people are so fucking parochial. I can't fucking believe that. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I wasn't wrong, Susan, to be yeah. honest with you, but you know, those divisions were still there. Uh -huh. And even now, you know, sometimes I'm in a lot of company, you know, very well thought of company, and I suddenly realise I'm, I'm, I'm definitely the only Catholic here. I mean, it must be like being Jewish, yeah. being a minority. And, you, you know, so, so for her to be... I mean, it must have been so much more um, pronounced for her. Because mm -hmm. um, it was just, we were just into the Reformation, so tensions were The, the were thing high. is, we weren't even really into the Reformation yeah. because the Calvinism was not yet the official religion of Scotland. Yeah. And I think that really needs to be taken into account when we think about the brutality of that murder. Mm -hmm. Because those people really believed that if they... Um, did not successfully carry out this coup. They would, they could all be killed. Yeah. They could all be martyred. That was not inconceivable. And I think it's easy for us to look back and say, well, you know, Calvinism became the official religion of Scotland. They're just picking on this. I mean, yeah. they are really in fear of their lives, yeah. and they're in fear of their property, which may be a more visceral fear. Yeah. Um, uh, because the Parliament were meeting that on the week. Monday. Yeah. And they were going to divest all the roustabout lords yeah. of their lands and titles. Yeah. Um, and uh, um, so that was probably more important than the religious divide. Yeah. For me, one of the more one of the most interesting characters was Henry Year. Yeah. Uh, and, and I have researched Mr. Google. Uh, I, I can't find a Henry Year. Oh, right. Did Did you make him up? No, or did he's he real. Exist? He no, was he's real. real. He's real. Yeah. yeah. And so Henry Year is this character who um, is really, he's a true believer. Yeah. And, um, but a so former priest. Former priest. Yeah. And becomes a really fervent Catholic. Yeah. 
and um, he he just fervent remind, Calvinist, fervent Calvinist, yeah. pardon. But he he reminded me so much of uh, you know true believers, anti-vaxxers, yeah, just those absolutely certain people. January the sixth coup in the states. I don't uh -huh. know if you've watched any of the documentaries yeah, about it's it. Yeah, been excellent. But those people really thought they were right. Yeah. Now, on the face of it, they're so so wrong. They're attacking guards mm -hmm. at their work and mm -hmm. killing them. Mm -hmm. You know, but they they truly believed, and and they're they're fighting for the benefit of other people, never for themselves. So yeah. they're taking absolute positions and sacrificing themselves for it. Yeah. Um, which I'm, I'm sure we can all agree is a delicious proposition, especially if you're young. Do you know absolutely. what I mean? It's just lovely to be to know absolutely. But Henry Year basically was one of two people that were killed, that were um, um, executed for that coup. Yeah. Um, so Lord Darnley was very, very involved in the coup. Yeah. He basically set it up, and then three days later he offered a reward for. And anybody who'd been involved in the coup. And those two lonely, lonely yeah. guys are the only people that get executed. Come back to Year in a minute, because I think he was a fascinating <laughs> character. Uh, but how much literary license did you take? So in your novel, uh, Darnley and Rizzio ha have been lovers. Yeah. And as far as I can see, that's essentially contested in history. Uh, how much did you decide to invent uh, yeah, I just thought I'm just going to be really cheeky. Uh, no, but I mean, that, but Darnley did sleep with men and women, and he right. did go to male brothels. We know that. Right. Um, and uh, we know that Rizzio slept in his bed, not by the side of his bed, in his bed. Yeah. Um, which you know, the bed was a public space at that time, so your servants would sleep at the end of your bed, right. um, in case you needed the toilet or you wanted something. Um, uh, so it, sleeping was not a private matter right. um, but Rizzo slept in his bed and they were very very close at one time mm -hmm. and also um, uh, there's never a discussion of uh, a woman around Rizzo which given his but social Darnley, position. Did Darnley not believe that Mary and Rizzo were lovers or was that just a convenient fiction to how allow often, his brutality? Well how often are women accused of sleeping around in history? Yeah. It's such a tired old yeah you know, allegation, do you know what I mean? And then James VI is born and these, 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 people who don't believe that he's the, the proper king call him <coughs> Davy's boy, yeah. David Rizzio's boy. boy. But he's ginger, ginger right? Aye. His dad's not Italian, I'll aye. tell you that. You know aye. what I mean? Aye. I mean, his skin is almost tartan. He's, 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 his skin is the same colour as mine. You can see all his veins, even in portraits where they've fancied him up. Um, uh, so um, I think that was just a slur. Aye. You know, I don't think I don't think he thought that. And Mary, Queen of Scots, they're only like a year and a bit into their marriage. Yes. So she is crazy for Darnley, and Darnley was a very attractive man. Yeah. And um, uh, and and he was known. In fact, I, I did the. Big he was known as a bit of a shagger, really, wasn't he? Well, <laughs> Susanna Lipscomb. To, to put it colloquially. Which I didn't know. <laughs> Susanna Lipscomb. He was putting it about. I think is the historically right, favourite right. term. Yeah. Um, Susanna Lipscomb said he was he was called a cock chick, which okay. meant he was shagging guys. Right. Right. Okay. So he was shagging guys. Uh -huh. Ritzy was attractive. He's sleeping in his bed, and and, and Darnley's drunk all the time. Which it could, doesn't take which a, could, it doesn't could. take a leap of the imagination to, to, to fill that in that something yeah. was a bit of a bit of rumbling and um, uh, uh, so I mean I think his relationship with Rizzio I think they, they were boundaryless people because of the yeah. power imbalance yeah. between them and everybody else yeah. and and I, so I mean I don't think it's a massive leap of the imagination yes. to suggest what well, I mean to some extent Rizzio is, is not in any way the major character. Mm. in the book, I didn't think. And I, I thought, I wonder why she called it Ritzio rather than Darnley, because he's mm. far more central to it in, in some ways. Why, yeah. why Ritzio rather than Darnley? Well, because he was the inciting incident. He's yeah. what happened. And also with Darnley, you've got so many events that the book could have been about. Uh -huh. So mm. many, you know, weekends that were about Darnley, yeah. like when they finally assassinated him. And uh, and I love this story because they basically, they, they, they don't, it's like my mum trying to work a computer, right? <laughs> They get gunpowder and they don't really understand how it works because it's very, very new. Uh -huh. So they just pack, they say, oh, look, we'll use gunpowder. And everyone <coughs> goes, oh, yeah, gunpowder, brilliant, yeah. They don't really know what it does, but they know it explodes. Uh -huh. So they pack an apartment full of gunpowder below Ritzio's apartments yeah. and they set it off. And basically he is rocketed across Edinburgh 
Um, but maybe Darnley's not. Apart Darnley. Below Darnley's apartment. Below yep, Darnley's apartment. Already, they just blew uh, him up. Uh, but they didn't really understand about, you know, anything about explosives. Yeah. Um, so they just thought it's a massive, you know... But that, that's been called the greatest unsolved mystery in Scottish history, who actually killed Darnley. And I wondered if you had plans to do a sequel and explore, explore that more. And then subsequently, Mary's, um, I don't know if it was a Confinement? consensual relationship with Bothwell oh, or whether she was, so you know... that's so interesting, that relationship. I love Bothwell. Raped. I know he's a rapist, but... Um, <laughs> uh, but, but, but you know, we, we matter like that aside. Well, you know, if you go into history, honestly, <laughs> the fact that we know Bothwell is a rapist tells right. you that he didn't win. Yeah. It doesn't mean that he was a special guy or doing anything anybody else wasn't doing, to be honest with you. I mean, Robert Burns wrote letters about raping people, but we all brush over that, do you know aye, what I mean? Aye. I mean, that you know, things have changed dramatically in the last 30 years because well, of women like you and I, Susan. <laughs> oh, yeah, nice. I, want, I wanted to ask you about that and, and the contemporary relevance. I mean, there's a couple of quotes uh, where you, you say, for example, one, page 74, you say... No one really cares about Scotland, they just want to mess with England. And then in another part, you describe attitudes towards Mary, and you say, they will say she's making it up to gain sympathy, a charge levelled at victims by powerful men since time immemorial. And of course, I thought of Me Too, the yeah. contemporary debates over Brexit and independence and all the binaries. Did, yeah. you, did you consciously decide yeah, to explore yeah. these contemporary themes? I'll be honest with you, I didn't really think this book was going to be as popular as it is. Uh -huh. I just thought it would be a writing exercise, so I was quite yeah. um, reckless. Very well reviewed. Yeah. Incre well, I mean, and, and also... So many people have read it. I, right. can't, I really can't believe how many people have read it. But every so often... It's upstairs for anyone who hasn't yet. And, uh... Or you can borrow it from the library as well. Um, uh, um, I hope the booksellers aren't in the room. Um, uh, but, uh, but it, um, I, I mean, I just thought, I'm just going to be fast and reckless with this because, mm. you know, if you think about what people are going to say about it, but there were so many contemporary points of reference, yeah. like, um, is Scotland going to face England or Europe? That binary has been set. It's always existed and we always act as if it's brand new. It's um, not brand new, yeah. it's always existed. Yeah. And it has never been resolved. Yeah. It's a philosophical question about identity. And, uh, and um, I mean, it, it just really, really struck me that mm -hmm. this is an ancient question and mm -hmm. yet there is no historical context in which we discuss it. Mm -hmm. We don't discuss it as a historical. We don't discuss, for example, wait, 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 the wait, binary wait. means yeah. that you have to choose an identity. Aye. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Aye. Which is like that question is not resolved because maybe it's irresolvable and maybe we should be making pragmatic decisions mm -hmm. instead of deciding about, you know, are we... Brexiteers or non brexiteers Do you know what I mean? Yeah. What, you know, why are we being presented with philosophical conundrums with a binary answer? These are mm. very complex questions. And the thing about women, not that, that was so interesting because the, the accounts of that night are available online. So you yeah. can get Mary's letters about what happened. Yeah. You can get Ruthven's defence of what happened um, online. It's quite difficult to read, but you can access all this stuff. It's very easily available. And uh, Mary says a couple of things that just resonated so much with me. One of them is that John Knox's son-in-law had a loaded musket yeah. and the barrel of it brushed her pregnant belly. Mm -hmm. And everyone says that didn't happen. But if you've... Just the idea of... She would remember the physicality of that. And she would remember that. that Darnley is pressing was pressing on her, yeah. her pregnant belly yeah. and allegedly trying to cause a miscarriage. Well, you know... No? Pre yes, absolutely. Yeah. But pregnancy was such a mystery then. Yeah, and, and, and so many women died in the so last trimester. It was trimester. one in two, Aye. you know? Yeah. Yeah. And um, so the idea that if you did... Everybody was very careful around pregnant women because they didn't really understand yeah. um, anything about it. So the Some idea things that, haven't changed. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. people still feel free to touch pregnant women without asking. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, she was six months pregnant. Yeah. She escaped, got on a horse galloped to Dunbar yeah. and then led a rebellion coming back. Yeah. So the next time you say, I'm a bit tired because you're up the duff. <laughs> you know what I, mean? <laughs> I did nothing but eat cakes the whole time I was pregnant. <laughs> Would you like to read yeah, sure. uh, from the, the novel? I mean, one, some of the things that, that some of the critics are saying is that part of its power 
is that you write uh, in very direct language and contemporary idiom. And I think you describe Yair as a, a killing spree looking for an excuse, uh, which I thought was a fantastic line. Yeah. So if you'd like I'll, to I'll, just, I'll just read the start, actually. And this, is, this sort of sets it up and gives you the tone. Um, but I try to write it. I was thinking about writing it in contemporary language. Oh, yeah. All the history books that I read where they made up contemporary language to the time, yeah. they sounded cantish. Yeah. It was, do you know, it's a yeah. very difficult thing. It might even be absolutely right. They, they might be quotes from people, yeah. but they sound phony baloney, really. What's, what's your favourite biography? I mean, Antonia Fraser's is, is probably the best well known. I and hated most. That. Yeah, I hated I've, it. I've actually, I've, I've, it's one I've never managed actually to finish. Oh, I, <laughs> do you know, I had to read it. I had yeah. to read it. I hope, she, I, hope she, I hope nobody here knows her. This has um, been recorded. Or? Is it? <laughs> um, and I, I, it, it was written in a tone that I thought was... Um, uh, but it's Unctuous. very old. Aye. It's very old. Aye. Do you know what I mean? And, um, uh, and I think, you know... Yeah, anyway, I was reading it and it's, it's quite a chunky thing and I was travelling and, I, and I, I thought, I'm not carrying that all the way around with me, so I ripped it in half. <laughs> <laughs> Which I've done with several books, actually, and it always means I'm annoyed at the book. Right. Um, and uh, so I've still got the ripped in half copy. But there's a fantastic one by Alison Weir. Right. And then there's a brilliant book yeah. by a man, I can't remember his name, and it's called The Murder of David Rizzio. Murder at the Palace, The Murder of David Rizzio, or Death at the Palace or something yeah. like that. It's brilliant. I mean, it's absolutely brilliant. Yeah. And, um, and not very well known, actually. I've spoken for, to a lot of people. For, for people who are interested in, in Mary, Queen of Scots, um, Glasgow University last week um, put a free course on. It's a, it's a platform called Future Learn. And full disclosure, Open University owns 50% of it. Uh, but there are courses from universities and museums from all over the world uh, free. And they just launched the, the Mary Queen of Scots one, which was quite timely when I was researching yeah. uh, for today. Uh -huh. uh, so Future Learn, uh, Glasgow Uni, for, for those interested. Brilliant. When you go to uh, yeah, so anyway, so I wrote it. So, I mean, it was a bit of an experiment. So I just, yeah. I just wrote it as I saw it. Yeah. There's a fantastic writer called Jane Gardham who wrote a book, uh, a series of books. She's amazing. And she wrote a series of books called Old Filth. Right. Which are really beautiful. Have you read those books? They are fantastic books. And um, and I so I stole this technique from her at the very beginning, mm -hmm. where she at one point she starts writing it as if it's a teleplay. Right. And it's barristers talking to each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are absolutely beautiful, um, beautiful books. And she's she's, I mean, amongst writers, if you say her name, everybody sighs. But she's not incredibly well known. But anyway, um, David Rizzio plays tennis with his assassins. Late Saturday afternoon, 9th of March, 1566. Indoor tennis court, Palace of Hollywood, Edinburgh. Lord Ruthven wanted him killed during this tennis match, but Darnley said no. Lord Darnley wants it done tonight. He wants his wife to witness the murder because David Rizzio is her closest friend, her personal secretary, and she's very pregnant. So Darnley hopes that if she sees him being horribly brutalised, she might miscarry and die in the process. She's the queen. They've been battling over Darnley's demand for equal status since their wedding night. And if she dies and the baby dies, then Darnley's own claim to the throne will be undeniable. They're rivals for the crown. She knew that from the off. So he wants it done in front of her. Darnley serves to Rizzio and Rizzio returns it with an elegant stroke. The cork ball soars across the court, reaches the far quarter and bounces high enough to land on the sloped wooden awning over the watcher's benches. There's a loud smack as it lands, rolls to the edge and falls onto the court. Plop, plop, plop. Point to Rizzio. Underneath that sloping roof is a man called Henry Yair. He's watching the game, sitting on a bench built into the wall of the indoor court. He's Lord Ruthven's retainer, here to keep an eye on Darnley for the boss. Yair hates everyone here, and he especially hates tennis. Tennis is what's wrong with people. Year is very pale, his eyes rimmed red because he hasn't been sleeping. He's watchful, he sees plots everywhere. He thinks in binaries, good, bad, man, woman, Calvinist, Catholic, for God or against God. Once fervently Catholic, he's now ferociously Calvinist. When he saw the truth, he embraced it 
and he hates those who don't, those Catholic holdouts. How can they hold on to these old broken ideas? How can they defend a church so corrupt, so murderous, such a betrayal of the one true faith? They disgust him. He doesn't know how they can live with themselves. Other Calvinists congratulate him on his passion. They overlook the implied violence of his fanaticism because he's on their side. The Reformation is recent, the issue undecided. It's not yet safe. Everyone is afraid of a revival of the Roman religion, of being killed for their beliefs, of spies and foreign interventions, and men as hot and spirited as ye are useful to the Protestant movement. So tomorrow morning, when fellow Calvinists hear that ye was creeping around Edinburgh, when they learn what he did and who he killed, they'll all feign surprise, but in the darkness of their hearts they'll each remember his sallow face and his wide, watery eyes his explosive reaction to any hint of dissent, and they'll admit to themselves that this was inevitable, that they rewarded his disquieting fervour, and they've long known this could happen. Could have been any one of them stabbed in their beds. Year was always a killing spree looking for an excuse. Wonderful. Thank you. <coughs> As I say, I, I found Year uh, the most fascinating of characters and at the beginning he thinks in binaries and then he murders Black who's a priest and suspected of being a spy and, and he's, he's a great character yeah, yeah. He's, he, he was real so Year was involved in the murder spy? of Rizzio well he was Catholic so if you think about uh, Catholics at the time the idea was well your allegiance is with Rome so you have mm. dual loyalties. Mm -hmm. So if, you're, if you are Catholic, your allegiance is to Rome, so you must be secretly working for them instead of for the country. Yeah. So that, I mean, that you see that now in discourse about Muslims. Yes. Is your, is your loyalty it, to it. Scotland or to your faith? You yeah. shouldn't have to choose. No. We all inhabit a multiplicity of identities. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And uh, so year, and so, um, Adam Black, was known as John Noir. That yes. was supposed to be his spy name. Yeah. And uh, he, isn't that great? I wish somebody That's... would write a series of books about uh, John Noir. If only we'd a writer here. I know, I know. <laughs> but I, I just, I just, I'd love to read them. I don't know if I'd like to write them. But so he was um, Mary of Guise's uh, priest. Yes. And for some reason he was tolerated, but he was from Edinburgh. So he's got a house in Edinburgh. Yeah. So he was just back briefly visiting. And, uh, and he was stabbed in his bed by year. And it was year. Yeah. And there was another priest killed that night in Edinburgh. Um, I think also I think he was also stabbed, uh, but it was basically after Rizzo, everybody just thought, oh, let's just go mental. Let's just go. Let's just go for it. You know yeah. what I mean? And uh, uh, so there were two, two priests murdered in Edinburgh, but John Noir was the only one that um, anyone was done for. Yeah. So Year in the beginning thinks in in binaries, and then just before he kills Black, you say he can see both sides of the argument, and then. When he's about to be hanged, you say it's all been decided for him. So he lived a Catholic, became a fierce Calvinist, and then you seem to suggest, seeing both sides of the argument, but it has all been decided for him. So he definitely died a Calvinist. Yeah. Let's speak about that a little bit about the um, I just, you know, I'm really interested in um, absolutes, people who mm. have an absolute position, yeah. and people who, um, I mean, I remember from being young. Susan and I were both very involved in the feminist movement. You wouldn't think it to look at us because we both looked so surrendered um, <laughs> in our flowery skirts. But, uh, but when we were young, yeah. uh, there were absolute positions. Yeah. Separatist feminism yeah. Oh, was, yeah. was the absolute position. Feminism I, was the theory, lesbianism was the praxis. That's right. I fancy guys. Yeah. There was nothing I could do about that. So yeah. I was already... I was pure. Oh, but, well, <laughs> but you weren't. You were never that... No. You were never that rigid, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And if you are in an absolute faith situation and you can see both sides, I mean, there is a way to overcome all these absolute mm -hmm. binaries, mm -hmm. uh, all these conflicts, mm -hmm. and that is that you set both parties down and they have to describe the other position to the Absolutely. satisfaction of the other party. Yeah. But it is such a, you know, it's such a, a difficult thing to do yeah. because you have to really empathise mm. that it's very little used in dispute resolution. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's mediation. That's what mediation yeah. does. So, you know, I think about these people with absolute positions and I envy them because it is delicious mm -hmm. to feel that you're on the side of right. 
But at the same time, that was never really available to me. Mm -hmm. and, and I think if you have a constitution where you can see both sides, yeah. it's really, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's not really available to you. So I was really thinking about that and I was thinking about Trump and the bafflement of Trump and yeah. the fact that he got 70 million votes yeah. Yeah. in the election. Despite and could what, arguably run again. And could run, <laughs> despite what we're seeing, because we're looking yeah. at him and we're thinking, you are just a con man, yeah. to me, to my eyes. So, you know, I think it's useful to try and understand what other people are saying. Yes. So it, it was that dichotomy. I mean, I suppose that is a binary, is, you right. know, being able to see both sides or having an absolute mm. position. And uh, and it just struck me very much that, you know, thought, if you, if I really wanted Year to be saved at the end. Right. Because he was such a victim and he was such a scapegoat. And, you know, even if you, if you um, did believe that Trump was right, you would storm the Capitol. They thought it was 1779. They thought yeah, that, yeah, you know, yeah. you would storm the Capitol if you thought Trump was right. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. anyway, so it was, just that, it was so, just that discourse I was kind of thinking yeah. about, and I was thinking, you know, I really wanted him uh, to be saved by his own measure at the end. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. When, I, when I think about all the binaries and, and the rise in absolutism, so we've got Brexit and Remain and independence and unionism and, and within contemporary feminism a, a raging debate about trans activism, oh God, yeah, sex yeah. and gender and um, I actually think your, your technique of asking someone to explain the other side's position yeah. is very, I, I have a friend who's an academic and he does that with his students yeah. regularly but I, I wondered what you thought the cause or causes of the increase in absolutism and rigidity and, and intolerance um, as, as frequently seen on Twitter, which we were talking about earlier, um, and, and what the solution might be. Big questions for a Sunday morning. Well, yeah. I, think, I think my lived experience is that's bullshit. Yeah. That actually, you know, that's not really what's going on. Right. I think the way it presents, I think if you're very, very angry, you're likely to go on Twitter and have a say. Aye. But the vast majority of people are kind of, well, I can see both sides. Yeah. I, I, I really do. There's a really brilliant, um, <coughs> um, the Longview programme on Radio 4 with oh, yeah. Jonathan Friedland. Yeah. And he talks about the, the invention of the internet and the invention of the printing press as two um, parallels. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So when the invention of the printing press happens, everyone thinks, oh, we're all going to be, you have access to all the knowledge of the world. We're yeah. all going to be... Yeah. You know, and actually what happens is the Reformation yeah. and, you know, woodcuts of the Pope <coughs> as the Whore of Babylon. And, but I think those are the things that you notice, mm -hmm. you know. Mm. Uh, those are the things that grab attention. And also the way the, way the news is presented is as binaries and yeah. reverses. Yeah. I mean, from a writer's point of view, that is what the news is, is yeah. reverses. And, yeah. and, and I was talking to somebody and they were saying that they were... Um, uh, uh, it was a, a guy and he was being outed as a sexual harasser and um, and I was saying the reason that guy has been outed as a sexual harasser, he's not really a sexual harasser, he's just a, a lech, was because he had presented himself as a family man. Oh, yeah. Right? So yeah. if you say, you know, um, uh, you're not going to be presented as a as a lech if you say I'm a bit lecherous. Right. Russell Brand yeah. has never been presented as, yeah. you know, as a lech because he keeps saying I'm a lech. Or so it's one, about reverses yeah. and it's about binaries and the right. newspapers love binaries. Yeah. And actually, when you read, you know, especially in headlines and yeah. you know, Twitter have introduced this thing where you actually have to read the article. Yeah. It asks you, do you want to read the articles? Because people are trading in um, headlines and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. You know. You remind me of the, um, talking about the hypocrisy of the, you know, scores, scores is perhaps an exaggeration, of, of closeted gay Tory MPs in the 80s yeah. who were uh, proselytising for, for Clause 28 and, yeah. and were then outed as not being quite the family men they yeah. purported to be. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. To some extent, this book, I think, um, is about men behaving badly. Mm. I mean, behaving absolutely atrociously and the power of groupthink amongst mm. those men, which you refer to as, as the great men of, of history, who are in fact just psychopathic killers just grubby, and drunks. They're just grubby, uh, grubby people that want more. Yeah. 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 But I thought the men's behaviour contrasted very nicely with the scene where Lady Huntley 
is comforting Mary and they're pretending that Mary is having a miscarriage in order to, to effect escape. And of course, Lady Huntley had, had reason to loathe and detest Mary uh, because Mary had had her husband killed and her son uh, killed. No, it's better than that. Yeah. She didn't have her husband killed. Oh, her husband right. rose in rebellion Exhumed. against yeah. Mary yeah. and died of a heart attack on the battlefield. So yeah. Mary had him taxidermied, uh, this is, yeah. wheeled into the Scottish Parliament and he was put on trial. This De deed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And he was... He was found guilty. I don't know who his lawyer was, but he was found guilty. Well, I mean, ar arguably in the contemporary Scottish par Parliament, there's a few that look a bit stuffed, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but you know what? I was talking about that at the Edinburgh Festival, and this woman got up at the back and she said she was involved in a community group in Edinburgh. Aye. And she said, I wonder if this is, because it's around the same time, was Aye. this guy had done something and he was um, exhumed, stuffed and put on trial. So I think a taxidermist in Edinburgh was was had leaflets made or something like that. <laughs> Some guy in Edinburgh had a taxidermy shop and he was like, I could do that. <laughs> yeah, I dug him up. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I'd love to know that story. But um, so, but Lady Huntley. Now this is one of these amazing things that you just don't read in history, right? Because we have yeah. such a rigid idea of what changes the world. Yeah, yeah. What changes history? The great men of history. Um, you know, this idea that, that history is made by one person going in and forcing Great their man. will on yeah. everyone else. Yeah. But actually, there are lots of things... But you know, sometimes when you're following a case in court and, and you feel like there's a paragraph missing, because how did that happen? And now suddenly we're on to another... Like O.J. Simpson, yeah. right? You read it, you, you know, you're following it and you're kind of like, how did we get to innocent from that? What are we not... What's yeah. missing from this narrative, yeah. right? Um, and, and clearly what was missing from the OJ narrative was the whole history of white celebrities getting off. Because you never heard anything yeah. like that during that. Um, but, uh, but in this particular history, Lady Huntley has been made to be a servant. She's mm -hmm. carrying piss pots. Yeah. Um, she's, you know, there are lots of missing people from this story because Mary always has a fire. Mm -hmm. so Who makes a fire? She's supposed yeah. to be on her own, Aye. right? She's Aye. just like Mary was left alone in her chambers, but she always has a fire. She always Aye. has food. Aye. Her bed is getting made. She's getting dressed. You can't Aye. put those clothes on yourself. Yeah. So there are obviously loads and loads of people around, but Lady Huntley is carrying piss pots. She's sitting with her while she takes a dump, right? Aye. Aye. Um, and this has been a very high noble woman. Yeah. Um, and then she did coach Mary, Queen of Scots, into how to pretend to have a miscarriage yes. because she had had miscarriages. Yes. Now, her son has left with Bothwell, and I love their friendship, those yeah. two guys. They yeah. are clearly actually friends. Yeah. Even from the most scant accounts, they are pals mm -hmm. who make each other laugh and do things yeah. because they're together. That they were you hinting they were lovers? No, no not at all. No, no. Um, uh, no, I just think they were pals. And I just think you know when you most relationships in history are transactional, but everything is presented as yes. transactional yeah. and capitalist yeah. in history, right? Mm -hmm. So no one does anything unless there's money in it for them or power. What Lady Huntley here does is the same sort of thing that Nelson Mandela did. Nelson yeah. Mandela got out of prison and was not seeking revenge. Yeah. And that was just like baffling to history. That changed yeah. history. We can't explain it, right? I think, I think Mandela was very Christian. I think he was a very devout Christian man. Mm -hmm. He never spoke about it because he knew it would be divisive. Mm -hmm. But I think he worked very hard to forgive people when he was in prison. I'm not a Christian, by the way. I've got nothing to say. But um, I, but I think I think that those things are not reported in history mm -hmm. because they don't fit with the the kind of narrative arc that yeah. we're used to. So what Lady Huntley did was she coached Mary Queen of Scots into um, pretending she was having a miscarriage. So they left her alone in a kind of I don't expect you, I expect you to die, Mr. Bond. But she's like, what did they think was going to happen anyway? Um, and she organised the escape. Mm -hmm. of Mary Queen of Scots so yeah. that she could get away. Yeah. And that is just inexplicable. And it's, 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 it's a beautiful section in, in, in the book. And, and Mary is asking Lady Huntley why she is being so kind, uh, given that she does have reason to hate her. And, and you have Lady Huntley say, in those days, I often wished for a sister to hold my hand. I thought that was beautiful. Yeah. So that, was, that, that was written in lockdown, actually, because it was such a scary time and so many people were dying. Yeah. And I just thought, this is... I was wondering if you wrote this in lockdown. I did write, I remember I, now, because I remember yeah. that line, and I remember thinking, you know, the, 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 I don't know if people remember the first lockdown, but a lot of people were dying, and yeah. if you had anyone in your family who was vulnerable, it was very, very frightening. Yes. And, um, and I thought, you know, this... 
somebody, there was the, 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 the anniversary of 9-11, they were talking about it and they were saying, before we went to war in Iraq, there was a week when the whole world grieved together mm -hmm. and there was a tenderness mm -hmm. about it where you could harness that grief and do something truly great with mm -hmm. it. But George Bush was a populist mm -hmm. and he knew that revenge would sell and mm -hmm. it did. And mm -hmm. they pulled it and it sold and that's why we mm -hmm. went to war with Iraq. But actually, that value of we are all in this together. I mean, I, I saw beautiful things in the park during lockdown, you know. Yeah. People walking their dogs on their own, older people, you know, young people that you wouldn't have put with them, calling over and saying, do you need any shopping? Can I do I, anything yeah, for you? That, I, that kindness yeah. that was around, you know, and it, that will not be remembered. No, what will be because remembered people is, have got so angry. I mean, I, rem I remember yeah. thinking somewhat naively and, and hopefully uh, during the first lockdown, because people were checking in on neighbours yeah. and we were clapping for the NHS and even the the debates in the Scottish Parliament, all the parties were, were working together and they each had faith that people were doing what they thought was best, yeah. even if, if mistakes were, were made. Um, and, and I thought, ah, oh, this, is, this is a new communitarianism, but it fairly quickly evaporated. But it was there. Aye. Let's hang on to that. But, yeah. the, the, you know, it's like, you know, writers always say, you can't write about happiness. You can write about unhappiness. Yeah. It's very easy to depict that. Each family is unhappy Happy in its in own, own way. way. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and so it's very difficult to, to remember that. It's hard to fix that in your head. Um, but conflict is so much more compelling because we're, I'm because trying, we're to, I'm trying to think of a novel that's about happiness. I can't think um, of one. Um, I'm sure there start. are passages about happiness, but happiness reads as a blank. Yeah. Because, you know, we're animals, so you're always scanning the horizon for saber-toothed tigers, yeah, you know? Yeah. That makes us feel alive. Danger mm. makes us feel alive. Conflict <coughs> makes us feel alive. But happiness is very difficult to depict and it's very difficult to, um, uh, to, to keep in your memory. But we should remember mm. that because that, that tenderness of Lady Huntley, yeah. and I'm sure it was it's about a grief. Passage. I'm sure it was about <coughs> her grief. Yeah. Um, you know, she saw a young woman on her own, about to be killed. Yeah. Her son had been executed. Her husband had died. Mm. And she just changed history yeah make really amazing and and you know memorializing those moments is very it's difficult and so we just tend to forget them yeah. i think so what, what what was your conclusion about about mary um naive victim or she was fairly 23. fairly savvy powerful player i'm not that i don't care <laughs> i don't care about royal people to be honest with you yeah but but i you know i, I really care about uh, people like Rizzio. Edinburgh was full of, of um, people from all over Europe yeah. when Mary came to the throne yeah. because they thought it was going to be absolutely amazing. Yeah. And there was a woman on the... I mean, Who'd also, and it's often forgotten, been, been Queen of France yeah. for a year because she married the, the yeah. prince. Yeah, and grew, yeah. Up in, grew up in Paris. Yeah. 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 And, um, uh, yeah, but, but I mean, I think, you know, the royals are so mystified, it's very difficult to write about them. And also she had a long life. So she yeah. went on and, you know, if anyone writes about you at 23, it would be, do you know what I mean? Thank God we didn't have social media when we were <laughs> 23, Denise, that's all I can say. <laughs> OK, well, I, 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 could, I could go on for some time, but I think the, the audience will probably want to, but just before we go over to the audience, any plans for a sequel? Or I know writers never like to... to talk about what they're working on now. Oh, I'll, talk, I'll talk incessantly. Good, what um, are you working on now? Uh, <laughs> but you know, it's really difficult because a lot of people have said, well, there'll be a follow-up, but yeah. this is part of a series. So yeah. next spring, Jenny Fagan is bringing out a book about the Scottish witch trials. Oh, great. And then Alan Warner is bringing out a book about Bonnie Prince Charlie called The Man Who Would Not Be King. Right, yeah. Um, and I don't want to write another one of these Until, and step yeah. on it, yeah. do you know what I mean? So, yeah. so um, uh, but I am writing a historical thing. Right, so is it, are you now really excited by this genre of doing a literary, just, literary Susan, treatment of historical... I just can't believe I get away with doing these things, because these things are fascinating to me, do you know what I mean? I get to do loads and loads of research. But the next one is about, it's for the BBC, I think, Aye. and it's about Savonarola. Okay. 
So I thought I'm not going to step on other people's because it is it is a courtesy thing. You don't yeah. want to just then bring turn it into a series by Denise Minor. Right. That lots of people are lined up, lots of people are doing research, lots of people are going to do brilliant work, and I can't wait to read it. But I just don't want to. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I don't want to be a yeah. hog. Yeah. I do want to be a hog, but I've, I'm a grown up and I can, okay. can pull I'd, myself back. I'd like another Paddy Meehan if you would. We do. Yeah. We do. I'd love to do that. Yeah. I think I'll turn to the audience, the gentlemen over. And the, um, the guide said, and uh, this is where Rizzio was murdered. Mm. And, um, and this is the bloodstain on the floor. Yeah. And, in in uh, the book. <laughs> oof, that's pretty amazing. And then I thought, well, that's also kind of convenient for the <laughs> Scottish tourists. <trip." laughs> um, and I just kind of wondered if, if, if it was a load of baloney or if, if there's... Um, first of all, is, am I, is my memory correct? And, yeah, it uh, is. Uh, I mean, how can that possibly be? Well, you're right to ask that question. Are there any Americans in the room? It's not real, I can tell you that. <laughs> uh, they actually raised the floor and uh, those rooms were abandoned for a really long time. No one was interested in Mary Queen of no. Scots until the English became interested and the Romantic movement, Walter Scott started writing about her. So those rooms were just used as a storage area. And uh, basically, the, the, I don't know if you saw the collection of things they have, Mary Queen of Scots' things like necklaces and handbags and stuff. And um, uh, all of them say traditionally associated with Mary Queen of Scots, made 10 years after she died. Because what happened was they just filled that, those rooms full of junk and no royal really stayed there uh, for about 200 years. And then um, Walter Scott w wrote about Mary Queen of Scots. She became very fashionable uh, after the Romantic movement. And English people started coming up to go to Hollywood to see her rooms. And they would go in and they would say, there's a necklace, that was Mary Queen of Scots's. So then they would put that in their collection. And later it was sold as, none of it was Mary Queen of Scots. It was just all junk that was chucked in there. Um, and uh, so she was so poorly remembered. And I think the reason she was so poorly remembered in Scotland was because it was such a shameful, it was pathetic what happened. It was really pathetic. And, um, uh, and I think the, the, the fact of it is uh, quite shaming. You know, the fact of what happened to her was quite shaming. There was a great moment. I did a documentary with Frank Skinner about um, Dr. Johnson and James Boswell. And Dr. Johnson said, uh, James Boswell was going on about Scottish independence and, you know, having their own ruler. And he said, Dr. Johnson said, you had your own ruler and you let them take her prisoner for 20 years and then execute her. And what a queen, he said, you know. So the, 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 at that particular time, there is a recognition of the fact that Mary Queen of Scots has been treated very badly, but not in Scotland. You know, she, she was characterised as an interloper and a foreigner and a woman, which was a, probably the bigger crime, actually, um, and attractive as well, which was a massive crime. And, uh, um, and really poorly remembered. So you're absolutely right, that was put there for the purposes of entrapping Americans, I think. <laughs> and you're remembering rightly, and there's a big brass plaque above it as well. Gen gentlemen there. Hi, Denise. Um, you said earlier that you embarked on the book as a writing exercise, which I found was fascinating. What, can I ask you what, when you went into that exercise, what were you hoping to get out of it and what surprised you as part of the process? Um, I was very surprised by year. Um, I was also very surprised by Holyrood. I don't know, I've never been to Holyrood, which is odd, because I mean, I do love a country house and do you know what I mean? And um, uh, I hope there's no curators here. <laughs> it's rubbish. <laughs> it's just a shit castle. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been to the National um, <coughs> Collection in Budapest, but it is laughably bad because the Nazis took everything, right? So it's like a half-done picture by Titian and, you know, the leg of a Chippendale table or something like that in this amazing setting. Hollywood feels like that. And the, the, um, the tower that Mary lived in is really amazing. Um, and then there's this sort of building on the back of it and everything's a little bit slopey. And, uh, and there's a room of the Kings of Scotland commissioned by a particular royal. 
Um, and every single, and it was done in hindsight, and every single one of those portraits looks like the royal who commissioned the series. <laughs> and they're not good. I mean, they're really not good. You can't even buy postcards of them because they're really not good, you know? <laughs> and, um, uh, uh, yeah, so, but, but getting the tour of Holyrood was absolutely amazing. And also, I'll just, yeah, anyway. Uh, so is, went, Lion, is Lion's Pit still there? No. No. No, get rid of it. those poor lions. I know. Oh, God. <laughs> they brought lions over. They had a lion pit to show everybody lions in Scotland. And, and it was open air. Imagine those poor creatures. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? A lion in Edinburgh in the winter. Um, uh, so I found that absolutely... But the contemporary um, resonances really were what amazed me was how current it felt and how... Um, uh, just how much it resonated with these absolutes. And when I say I wrote it as a writing exercise, when you write something as a writing exercise, you're just really ballsy. Do you know what I mean? I was very gung-ho about it. I thought this will be of interest to me and maybe three other people. I had no idea how many people would be interested in it, uh, which is quite delightful. But um, I mean, I have taken pelters from some historians because they're very angry about the fact that I've taken so many. I've said, you know, you know, there's a brilliant book about um, James VI. Uh, partner who ended up marrying somebody but he had it was I think it was called the king's wife or something like that uh, James VI was gay and uh, and he had a partner that he he had apartments for and he referred to him as my wife and um, that story is oh it's a brilliant book it's so well written I must get it for you I didn't know James VI was gay super gay Oh, wait till I tell my father. Like, <laughs> ah, massively gay. Massively, <laughs> massively gay. He had a wife. Right. And, um, uh, and he did refer to him as my wife. Right. And, um, uh, but, you know, there wasn't a gay, there wasn't a category gay at that no, time. No, no. Right? It was a gay Victorian is, Gay is concept. when it becomes illegal. Then yeah. to be gay is the thing that you have to be. It's yeah. like being criminal, yeah. right? Um, mm. So it's not an identity, it's mm. um, something that people do. And they can mm. also have children, they can also have families, because yeah, you need to do that. Activity rather than a, a it's description a, it's of a, it's a It's a preference yeah. rather than yeah. an identity. Yeah. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, so anyway, but there were always rumours that Darn, Darnley definitely visited male brothels, but I think a lot of people are quite cross about the fact that I said Darnley and Rizzo loved Darnley. I'm imagining one of these... Um, servants who, you know, follows the big noise around and how much they love them, like Smithers in The Simpsons. There's no way those people are not a little bit in love with the people that they're sidekicks to. That is a kind of love. Um, and, uh, yeah, anyway, so... But, but I was fast and, fast and reckless because I didn't think anyone was going to be looking at me and then all of a sudden lots of folk were looking at me. <laughs> well, it's, it's a novel. You know, I mean, the historians, well, the it is that, a novel. And historians also, write history. sometimes you get more to the truth through yes. a novelisation because yeah. you can pull out themes, right. which real life is just a series of random accidents. Mm. It doesn't really have themes. Mm. But the point about novelising truth facts is you can then have themes yeah. and you can say, isn't this interesting? Not just that it happened a long time ago, but isn't it interesting to look at this obliquely through time? Mm the fact of thinking in binaries, the fact of seeking absolute truth, mm -hmm. the fact of, um, you know, you, your sexuality is, is a currency and it's something you bring to a relationship with mm -hmm. someone who's more powerful than you, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. Whereas now, because of the um, rights-based discourse, we think of our physicality as purely belonging to us. Yeah. And we think of, you know, we think of... Um, you know, men and women in relationships, and that's her body, and this is his body. When you married, your husband owned your body. Mm. You know, we don't. That that's a very current construction, and it's nice sometimes to step outside those those parameters and look at things a bit more obliquely. Yeah. You know. Mm. Mm. Stand at the front. I read quite a lot about Mary Queen of Scots in lockdown. I got quite oh, fascinated, you? and the thing <coughs> that I kept thinking about. Uh, is the, the presumption, which, of course, you kept saying that she was 23, so yeah. even the presumption of when she married the Dauphin, you know, when she was taken away, when I mean, she was just a child. Yeah. So one of the bits that I kept getting stuck with was apparently the wedding china was what signed her death knell, was the wedding china for her marriage to the Dauphin, because they printed these plates and the tablecloths and everything was um, 
the, the Queen of three countries. So yeah. she was Queen of France, Queen of Scotland, and Queen of England. Oh, wow. And it was printed. They made the, all the ceramics yeah. all said this. And there's letters, because um, it became quite... <laughs> there's letters that were written by the, the English ambassador to France that described this China and said, that's it. You know, she, and so apparently there's a thread that she was never going to be given any kind of power because she had this, because she had a very good claim to the throne of England as yeah. well. And the fact that she was Catholic and a woman, it's just like, you're not, we're, you're not getting that. So the, it goes right. And she was about 13 when she married the Dauphin. So of course it wasn't her. You can't, well, I suppose you do get presumptuous 13 year olds, but she didn't print that China. She didn't. So it's just the way that this reputation was built up by others, you know, like, so although she is a wee bit mystical, it was just all those other people controlling her that kind of got her into that position. Oh, how interesting. I know, the plates. Death over a tea set. That is that is amazing. And, 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 I, and I suppose printing something at that time was massive. It was a statement. Do you know what I mean? Whereas now that, that doesn't mean anything. That's so interesting. And of course, Darnley had a claim to the English throne too. To, yeah. to, to some extent, the, yeah. the marriage... No, I don't do you think it was a love match or do you think it was political calculation? Well, his dad tried to marry her yeah. and she knocked him back Aye. and then she married Darnley. <coughs> I think she just, I'm just going to swear now, I think she fancied the arse off him. I think he was really attractive. Right. And I think, the, I think she came to Scotland and she thought, I am actually queen, yeah. which for a woman to have power. So, you know, suitors were put in front of her and she picked him. Right. So to be a woman... And to pick somebody, I mean, who do you pick at 23? Well, I made some bad choices. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and and, um, uh, and he was attractive, and she talked about how what a ride he was. Yeah, you yeah. Know? You say there's a bit in the book where they they spend four days in bed, yeah. basically having sex for four yeah. days. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's but nice that she had that though. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. But you know, any woman to own her own physicality at that time, that was really unheard of. Yeah. Do you know yeah. what I mean? For a woman to um, to make decisions on the basis of her own physicality yeah. was, you know, it was criminal. Yeah. Do you know yeah. what I mean? But she yeah. actually owned her physicality. Even now, you know, for women to yeah. to just say, well, this is my body and I like it and yeah. I'm not sad. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I am fat. Fuck you. Do you know what I mean? That's, <laughs> that's like, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. still quite shocking for, for a yeah. woman to own her physicality, you know? Well, this has been fascinating, but I see Miss Wisher, I think we could probably get one more in. Gentlemen down Oh, the no, front. you look American. I've spoiled Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> I've spoiled Hollywood. Yeah, well, maybe I should ask this question. Ah, you're American. American. <laughs> <laughs> no, I live like 100 yards along the road, so oh, I'm yeah, all right. Okay. <laughs> no, what I was thinking about what you were saying about binaries, and uh, maybe this is kind of outside of the purview of the book, and I haven't read it, but it just sounds so... I mean, obviously, I know the story fairly well and, you know, read a few things, seen the movies, etc. But, I mean, it just sounds so incredibly contemporary, the yeah. way you kind of... Mm -hmm. um, and, and it sounds like from the the way you've written the book is like that. But I suppose the one binary that maybe does exist then and now, which I wonder if you touch on it at all, is the sort of relationship between all these people in power and the sort of machinations and everybody else in the country who has to then just deal with all the fallout of everything. And, you know, that sounds extremely contemporary as well. And I just wonder if that you sort of touch gonna, on that. On the... We're going to have to be brief, Denise, because right. we need to have half an hour for all cleaning right. yeah. before the next event. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. No, but that's a great point. I'll, so, I'll talk to you outside, but yes, yeah, yeah that's very much... So Denise's yeah. books uh, and lots of other books are upstairs and Denise will be upstairs signing. Um, and Also available in libraries. <laughs> I like to give libraries a punch, a you know what I mean? Because you don't have to buy the product. No, you know. but it is a great read. You need to get in. It, 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 oh, sorry. It is, Ruth's telling me that you do. It is a great read and I'm delighted that the Open University was able to sponsor this and perhaps you could join with Susan, me. Susan, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Denise. That was lovely.